Beverage Alcohol Regulation. The story behind an effective approach. Many of us enjoy an occasional drink. And because our state values public health and safety, the beverage alcohol industry is carefully regulated. As a policymaker, you're responsible for making important decisions that affect alcohol regulation. And as you know, beverage alcohol is an intoxicant that should not be treated like toothpaste or potato chips. In fact, it's the only industry that was eliminated and recreated by separate amendments to the U.S. Constitution. Over the next few minutes, we'll take a look at how the modern beverage alcohol industry came to be and how the policies that regulate it continue to keep the focus on public health and safety. Thanks for taking the time to watch. Prior to Prohibition, the regulation of alcohol was loose or non-existent. And widespread overconsumption led to public drunkenness, domestic violence, and poverty. So in 1919, Congress passed the 18th Amendment, commonly known as Prohibition, which banned the manufacture and sale of beverage alcohol. Prohibition went into effect January 16, 1920, and ended December 1933. Prohibition supporters believe that simply outlawing alcohol would solve the problems associated with it. But they couldn't have been more wrong. Americans weren't ready to give up their right to drink, so they went about it in secret. And organized crime quickly stepped in to meet the demand for alcohol. By the early 1930s, even former supporters of Prohibition were publicly admitting its failure. As industrialist John D. Rockefeller Jr. put it, Drinking has generally increased. The speakeasy has replaced the saloon. A vast army of lawbreakers has appeared. Many of our best citizens have openly ignored prohibition. Respect for the law has been greatly lessened, and crime has increased to a level never seen before. Rockefeller realized that a government ban on alcohol would never prevent consumption. Instead, he believed that temperance, or moderate consumption, was the best approach. In 1933, he commissioned researchers Raymond Fosdick and Albert Scott to study the issue. Fosdick and Scott made several key observations and recommendations. First, alcohol isn't like other products. It's an intoxicant. And even though moderate consumption can have health and social benefits, overconsumption is dangerous to both the health of the drinker and to society at large. They also concluded that local state-based regulations could effectively limit the problems associated with overconsumption. The researchers wrote, If the new system is not rooted in what the people of each state sincerely desire at this moment, it makes no difference how logical and complete it may appear as a statute. It cannot succeed. Finally, Fosdick and Scott warned of the dangers of tied house arrangements, or vertically integrated operations, where the manufacturer controls the retailer, or where a supplier-distributor induces a retailer to push its product with something of value, like volume discounts or free equipment. Prior to Prohibition, when the manufacturer owned or in some way controlled the retailer, the manufacturer dictated the amount and brand of products the retailer sold. This created a high-volume, low-margin marketplace, forcing retailers to sell more alcohol at rock-bottom prices. And the consumer was left with little selection, lower-grade products, and the means to overindulge. It's this critical connection between tied house arrangements and overconsumption that led directly to a new approach to beverage alcohol regulation. In preparation for the 21st Amendment, which was set to repeal Prohibition in 1933 and allow the return of legal production and distribution of beverage alcohol in the U.S., most states began to implement the three-tier system based on Fosdick and Scott's recommendations. The first tier, the manufacturer, makes the alcohol. The second tier, the wholesaler or distributor, transports, markets, and delivers the beverage to the third tier, the retailer. Retailers include any establishment that sells alcohol to the public, from convenience stores to fine dining restaurants. What's most important in this system is that each tier is separate and independent, which prevents tied house arrangements and has also led to several additional benefits. Both before and throughout Prohibition, tainted beverage alcohol posed a significant danger to the public. And when manufacturers either owned or directly supplied retailers, product quality was not monitored. With the three-tier system, however, the wholesaler or distributor is responsible for transporting and storing alcohol until it's delivered to the retailer. This allows for close monitoring, removes the danger of counterfeiting, and ensures that product quality isn't affected during storage. Proper storage is an important wholesaler duty. 
would be impossible for small manufacturers to deliver their product nationwide in climate-controlled containers and remain economically viable. In addition to providing quality control, the wholesaler acts as a buffer between manufacturers and retailers and collects the required excise taxes. This provides the state with a cost-effective yet thorough means of tax collection. Third, by eliminating tied house arrangements, market competition is allowed to flourish, which wasn't always the case. Before prohibition, a single manufacturer could maintain its own production, distribution, and retail channels. As the company grew, it could push smaller competitors out of the market by underselling products, giving volume discounts, purchasing shelf space, and requiring retailers to carry products exclusively. But in the three-tier system, all manufacturers have access to the market, and wholesalers are free to carry a variety of products from different manufacturers. Wholesalers use their own resources and expertise to market new manufacturers' products, which levels the playing field even further and has fueled the rapid growth of independent manufacturers, with approximately two new breweries opening every day. For the consumer, that means more than 13,000 beer labels to choose from, a wealth of options that no other product category in America can deliver. Finally, the three-tier system of regulation provides for education to combat underage and problem drinking. Despite its success, the three-tier alcohol regulation system is sometimes challenged. On one hand, large manufacturers have argued that they should be allowed to distribute their own product and to own retail outlets, such as bars. But as Fosdick and Scott warned, these tied house arrangements would lead to overconsumption, lack of competition, and the disruption of government oversight, the very causes of prohibition. On the other hand, small manufacturers have reasoned that they should receive exceptions in order to distribute or sell their product in their local area. But if these exceptions were allowed, large manufacturers would quickly mount constitutional challenges based on the Interstate Commerce Clause, a situation that would lead to complete deregulation, the problems of pre-prohibition, and ultimately, the failure of these same small manufacturers. What would beverage alcohol deregulation look like? We can draw a clear picture by looking at a few examples outside our country. Americans often perceive Europeans to be more comfortable and responsible with alcohol. But evidence in the United Kingdom shows quite the opposite. As England's former chief medical officer, Sir Liam Donaldson, put it, quite simply, England is drinking far too much. England has a drinking problem. The UK systematically deregulated its alcohol industry in 1990, and by allowing a few large manufacturers as well as two massive grocery chains to control a large percentage of retail outlets, tight house arrangements are common. These power players have based their system on high-volume sales at low prices with heavy promotion, and it's led to the same problems America experienced before Prohibition. Death rates from cirrhosis of the liver have increased 120% for men and 70% for women. Alcoholic liver disease is up 230%. Acute intoxication, up 220%. A surge in underage drinking has come with overconsumption and violence. And an increase in alcohol taxes, already among the highest in the world, has proven to be ineffective. So, the epidemic continues. And without the separation of manufacturers, distributors, and retailers, it will most likely persist. In Russia, the lack of regulation has spawned a rapid rise of bootleggers selling dangerous products similar to what happened here during Prohibition. According to the Washington Post, more than 42,000 Russians die each year from alcohol poisoning and alcohol-related illnesses. And what's sold as vodka often contains cheap, toxic products, such as brake fluid, lighter fuel, disinfectants, and other poisonous agents. The three-tier system removes this threat because if by chance a tainted or counterfeit product is sold, it can quickly be traced back to the manufacturer, minimizing the danger to the public. With the widespread availability of alcohol, no regulatory scheme will be perfect. But without a doubt, our current three-tier system has effectively protected American society from the problems it was designed to combat. And it's produced a number of unintended benefits, like consumer protection and choice. Even so, we sometimes forget the problems that led to prohibition and think the regulation is a burden. But all it takes is a closer look at the current situation in other countries and our own experiences prior to prohibition to see that the likely effects of deregulation make it not worth trying that dangerous experiment again here at home. Simply put, the three-tier system has proven over the last 80 years that it's the most effective...